Rabbi, thank you so much for coming on Northern Vibe. I cannot tell you how excited I am to have you uh, and a big shalom to you from North Queensland. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's great honor to be here. Oh, great, mate. Look, time is, I know your time is really precious and really short. So we're going to dive straight in. Now, there is this bit, there is this concept that I have just cannot get out of my head. And it's this concept of the of the interplay between the finite and the infinite and uh, the nature of the perfection of God. Uh, now, I know that's deep, <laughs> and but I want to kind of dive in and, and start off with that one. So I'll play this, I'll play this little bit uh, of meant sense uh, and to give contextual background to you and the listeners so that we understand what we're talking about. I read, for example, an old Jewish commentary about the reason for creation. Whenever Jordan Peterson quotes a Jewish idea, I become both excited and nervous. Excited because he can potentially increase the world's appreciation of the original Abrahamic faith. But nervous because, well, he doesn't always explain it correctly. I have in the past critiqued Dr. Peterson's view of Judaism respectfully, but sometimes he nails it far better than I could have ever imagined. So I was pleasantly surprised when I heard him quote this supremely deep idea from the Kabbalistic tradition. Uh, a being with the classical attributes of God. And the question is, well, what does a being with those attributes lack? And the answer is limitation. Contained within this strange riddle lies the secret to the most important question of all. Why are we all here? If we can understand what this riddle is saying, it just may change how we understand the fundamental purpose of life. Here's the Mensch Sense take. Our Kabbalistic puzzle is seeking to answer a question, which Dr. Peterson explains is this. Why would a perfect God need to create anything at all? The solution is that in some strange way, God might be perfect, but there's something missing from perfection. What's missing? Well, imperfection. In Peterson's terminology, an infinite being lacks limitation. And so in order for limitation to exist, God creates our finite universe. Okay, problem solved. But if you're paying attention, this answer gives rise to an even bigger question, which is, What's so important about limitation? We've created this sort of word game by saying that perfection isn't really perfect because it lacks limitation. But that's like saying a really kind and generous person isn't so great because he's lacking cruelty and stinginess. Is that really a lack at all? So too, if we understand God to be perfect in every way, then what we're really saying is that God lacks evil and suffering, and that's somehow a limitation. But why then is a world of limitation so important such that God concocted this massive experiment called existence? Was it only in order to create suffering? Does that make any sense at all? To address this issue, we need to fill in one more detail that's missing from this puzzle. The revolutionary 20th century thinker, Rabbi Avraham Yitzchak Cook, explained this exact riddle in the following way. There are, in fact, two types of perfection. The first is a static perfection, something that exists flawlessly, unchanged beyond time and space. That is the realm of God, as stated by the prophet Malachi, I am God, I do not change. This perfection is like a diamond, unfazed by the passage of time. But there is another type of perfection, a dynamic perfection, that involves not just being perfect, but becoming perfect. Um, you know, you're welcome for me starting off on an easy question. I thought I'd throw this, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, let's let's, yes, let's start off light. Go but, straight but, for the fences, as we call it, say it. Oh, it's just so <laughs> beautiful. And and when you know, when I heard that rearticulated to me, um the, it, it just it it honestly I couldn't stop thinking about anything else because for me it made absolutely everything fall into place, Rabbi. Um, because once we understand interplay of the finite and the infinite and so you know god is both now you know in through creation is both finite and and infinite like that's just but everything absolute everything fall, falls into place when you kind of like understand that but please can can you can we just have at that and i'm really really keen on hearing hearing what you've got to say about that so this is just the a simple podcast, is it? <laughs> With uh, some quite deep uh, Kabbalistic ideas that you want, we want to um, speak about and discuss. 
Um, the first issue is that we have to understand something possibly a little simpler. And that is, God is not logical. Mm -hmm. God creates logic. Mm -hmm. So he's not limited to logic. Mm -hmm. So what we know about God or his intent or why is based on his communication through the Kabbalists. Kabbalah, the word Kabbalah means received. So we have a received tradition through the great Kabbalists who are seen, I guess, in a certain way, um, like prophets, in other words, receiving wisdom um, that is above and beyond what you would naturally gather through the uh, understanding of our physical world and um and through them we can we we get the appreciation of what the purpose of life is and if it isn't logical that's not a problem because god is not limited by logic that's our that's something um let's see that's that's a construct that God created. It's one of the uh, building blocks. It's the top, top building block, probably, in a certain extent, to um, to the human condition. But it is a human condition. Yeah. It's similar to kind of like um, saying, um, who made God? Yeah. And children always ask the question, who made God? The answer is, the whole point of God is that no one has to make him, right? He's the ultimate perfection. So uh, we come from a perspective that, that everything needs to be created. That's true because finite uh, beings need a, a cause. There's a cause and effect. So what's the cause of us being here? So we're called in, in, in actually Jewish philosoph philosophical words, uh, everything in existence is only a possible existence we don't have to be we're here because god chose us to be here mm -hmm. god is the only um necessary existence in other words he's here because he's here yeah. not because anything brings him into existence mm -hmm. so his entire existence is beyond our comprehension and what we get yeah, what we're able to understand about god is based on his communication to us and uh, the bottom line just go straight into it the reason that god creates the world is god wants a dwelling place on earth that is he wants us to perfect the world so that he is comfortable here yeah. so here you're taking this finite world and making it a um a home for an infinite god yeah which seems that doesn't make sense, right? How could the infinite fit into the finite? So the answer to that is he actually gives us infinite powers. Yeah. He gives us the ability to, to bring an element of infinity within this finite world. Yeah. Because I'll give you I'll give you something that kind of oh. you know, uh, an idea that could blow you away. Um you know where God is is most pronounced in the contradiction, right? In the contradiction of, say, because anything else is a construct, whether it be a physical construct or a spiritual construct. Yeah. The only space that is, that is possible for God himself is in the area of contradiction. So to give you a simple example, um, I'll tell you what the Talmud says. The, there was the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant had a, a particular measurement. It was two and a half um, cubits. Um, cubit is like a half a meter. So it was two and a half cubits by one and a half cubits. The room it sat in was like 20 cubits wide. Okay? But if you measured from 
the southern wall to the beginning of the arc, you got 10 cubits. And if you measured from the other side of the arc to the northern wall, there's also 10 cubits. And if you measured where this arc wasn't standing from wall to wall, it was also 20 cubits. That's not possible. Then you measured the arc and it's two and a half cubits. So it doesn't make sense. And it wasn't protruding. In other words, the arc took up space and did not take up space at the same time. Yeah. It was a, a, a beyond such a, it's not only beyond nature. It's not only miraculous. It's, it's, it's a contradiction that is hard to understand, yeah. right? Beyond our comprehension. Um, similarly, your listeners might be aware of the uh, holiday of Hanukkah. The holiday of Hanukkah, what happened? Simply, they came into the uh, temple. They reenacted the temple, uh, rededicated, that is, the temple. They found one jug of oil. That was enough to last for one night. And it would, it would take to get the proper oil uh, for the candelabra would be another eight. You would need eight days. So the oil that was enough for one day lasted for eight days. How was the how was this mir how did this miracle actually occur? Like what happened to this oil that went from one day to eight days? Answer. So there's a number of ways of seeing it, but my mentor, Lubavitch Rebbe, he he gives the following perspective. He says the same thing that happened. In other words, that those who say, well, simply, they put in an eighth of the oil and qualitatively it lasted what normally you would need a full cup you know, only an eighth of it did the trick so an eighth of the oil lasted as much as what uh you know eight times as much oil would would normally last hmm. that's one way of seeing it so that's a qualitative difference another way of seeing the miracle is that there was a a uh, a quantitative uh, miracle which means every day say they Fill the, the, they filled the jug, they filled the candelabra with the oil, and the next day they came back, poof, the oil came back again. Miraculously, it just appeared. And it, he asks questions by why that doesn't, that shouldn't, doesn't really work. He, bottom line, comes up with the following. It burnt and didn't burn at the same time. So it was natural oil. Yeah. And it burned and didn't burn, similar to Moses's the bush. burning bush. Yeah. The burning bush was burning, and not burning at the same time. Being consumed or not consumed. 100%. Right, right. So, so that is a paradox. Yeah. Right? Because if it's in the laws of nature and it's burning, then it has to be consumed. Right? It's not like some something from outer from, from elsewhere came into our existence. No, it's a burning bush that has the physical uh characteristics of fire, yeah. and it is consuming a bush, and at the same time, it's not. That is called uh, an impossibility. Yeah. And that is where the essence of God is seen more than anywhere else in this impossibility. Okay? So this impossibility gives to us. He, because we have a soul that is rooted in him, so he gives us this power of the impossible. You know, I like to think that the uh, the Jewish people, and we're seeing it in an obvious way now, are a testament to that. That uh, the fact that we exist throughout the ages with the anti-Semitism, yeah. the Jew hatred, yeah. that we're seeing present, um, the blood libels and the absolute Jew hatred that we have, and nevertheless, we've outlasted the Romans and the Greeks and the Assyrians uh, and the uh, Egyptians and uh, and Hitler and the Crusaders and and will outlast the uh, the Islamic terror as well. Yeah, uh, there's no question in my mind. Um, so this is uh, us. This is comes from from the fact that implanted within us is this impossible impossibility of the infinity of Asha, of God. That's so now we need to know what our purpose here is. Like, why does he put us on earth? And what he wants now, the, 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 the you might say, but why does this mean anything to him? 
So you could say what Rav Cook said, in, as as you pointed out, that he wants to have a relationship with another. The one I would put it a little slightly different. The one thing he doesn't have is otherness, right? The one thing he doesn't have is anyone else accepting him because he's the only being. He's the only true being. Yeah. And that is true even even at present, even as he creates us, he's really the only true being. Nevertheless. This is what he wants. He wants to have a relationship with us. He wants us to sense ourselves as other, as finite, as other, and to choose him with our, with our free choice. Even as he's concealed and even as, um, you know, people could deny his existence, he hides just enough for it to actually be an expression of our free choice to choose him. Yep. To choose our relationship and connection to God. Mm. So um that's that would be a my kind of my my, my take on, on on that interplay. Um the the idea of the otherness and the idea of he, he implants within us his sense of infinity, which is basically his ability to to exist within the paradox. Mm. Yep. You know, to me, that just makes perfect sense. Because, like, again, you have this, this interplay between the finite and the infinite, because... As you point out, I mean, we are limited beings, you know, born at this time, living so long, dying at this time. But we really do have the capacity of, of the infinite. So both in the, you know, I mean, this conversation, it's not completely infinite in the truest sense of the word, but it's like considering our limit, you know, it could have gone anywhere. But when you, when you recognize the capacity uh, for humans to for human imagination and for humans to conceive of the abstract and even quantify the abstract. So there you have like the fact that you can conceive of the inconceivable. You can, you know, mm. you, you can do that. That's like that little sliver of infinite God, you know, w within all of us. And it just makes mm. perfect sense. And so when I'm discussing this uh, with a lot of, because we live in an atheist materialistic, world right now rabbi you know i'm sure i hadn't need to tell you that it's not that uh but the more i look into this sort of revelation and it is revelation you know we've got to recognize this for what it is rabbi this is revelation okay that kabbalistic stuff that's i mean yes you know we have these brilliant people working on it yes these great minds are making sense of it uh you know jb jordan peterson is one of them the chap on men's sense is one of them you're one of them rabbi cook was one of them Absolutely. Yeah. hundred percent. But, you know, this is from God, but this is not, you know, human beings could not reason their way to this. It was the other way around. It was, it was revealed by God and then was like, Oh, then we worked it out. I just good. You know, yeah. The more I kind of That's like, true. the more I get this again, that does not invalidate uh, incidentally, that this is not to invalidate atheism uh, in the sense of in the Dawkins sense, because as you pointed out before, reasonable doubt in the existence of God as we see him, as Abraham, I mean, I'm, I'm a Christian, but like as Abrahamic people see and understand God, and we have much more in common than we don't. You know, understanding him that, that way, there must be reasonable doubt. He had to create reasonable doubt in his existence. Because I'm like, I'm talking to all these atheist friends all the time, and they always quote Dawkins. They go, well, why doesn't he leave more evidence? Like, why doesn't he leave incontrovertible in in proof of his existence? I said, he can't. Because then if there was no reasonable doubt in the existence of God, you would be forced to worship him purely out of a sense of fear and awe out of his power. So that invalidates love. So for there to be love, there needs to be reasonable doubt. Not only that, it takes away free choice. 100%. 100%. That's right? exactly what you know, so he creates right. enough concealment that it's out of our choice that we come to believe in him. Yeah. And therefore, there's value in, in what we've done. If it's, if it's compelled, it's, um, you know, it's. I'll give you something. I mean, we just had the holiday of Purim, right? Yeah. But this is what the 
Talmud says the in the in the in the uh, book of Esther, it says that um, um, the Jewish people re accepted that which began earlier. And the Talmud says what this, this what this means is that um, when the when God um, revealed Himself during Revelation, gave us the the Torah, gave us the uh, law. He uh, picked the mount. Mount Sinai, right? He picked it up and put it over our heads like a canopy. And he says, either you accept my law or this is your burial spot. And so therefore, so we said, oh yeah, sure. Of course, we'll accept it. So that creates a, a, um, a great caveat on our acceptance. We we're forced into it. Hmm. So then so let me and let me explain. So the Hasidic masters explain it this way. It doesn't mean he physically picked a mountain over our heads and said said that. Words, yeah. He sh mountain is it comes from the is a protrusion, right? Mountain is a protrusion out of the out of the earth. Hmm. That represents love. Love is a protrusion out of the heart. Yeah. God showered us with so much love that we couldn't say no. Hmm. So then that is actually the a little bit of a problem because if the reason we didn't say no is because we were forced not even if it wasn't a force you know or you have to you better or but it was a force of love it's still a force mm. it's still not coming from within us mm. right you get that yeah 100 makes sense completely. so yep so therefore the holiday of purim is when even as there was this decree and the Jewish people were concerned about their, um, their, their, their existence. Nevertheless, they, they, they stood, um, they stood shoulder to shoulder committed, committed, committed to God and, and accepting um, his, his, his tradition and his law and his Torah. And then we did, so out of our own free will, because there wasn't the revelation that was compelling. It was actually a time of concealment, a mm. time of exile is a time of concealment. It was a time of a decree. And nevertheless, we said we're 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 we remain steadfast in our connection and commitment to God. That says the Talmud is when the Torah was really received. That's when we really took it on, right? Because it was came from our free choice. So that's a, a, a central pillar of our theology, that there must be free choice. And if there's going to be free choice, there cannot be a... Um, God can't make himself so obvious yeah. as to take away our choice. Yeah, irresistible. It can't be an irresistible force in in, in any exactly. Sense. So it's not just like yes. too much too much information. Yeah, sorry, uh, irrefutable information, irrefutable love, irrefutable any of those things. And that's probably why David in the Psalms talks. You know, he kind of conceptualizes God as like this wooing lover, kind of like chasing people. Obviously, you know the the, the Jewish people, but you know humanity generally kind of like trying to entice them like into it it's it's just so and when you understand the and, and, and particularly in the song of songs yeah king solomon right which he, yeah. he uses this metaphor um of 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 love of a of a male and female um and it is which is it's it's basically this metaphor of our love for god mm. I have, chased, I have chased, I, you know, I, and, love, and I, the, I love, you know, the what the run, the asking the watchman, the running around, the oh, it's just it, it's exactly, like, yeah, exactly, and the you know the given, you know, first first uh, she's looking and then he's yeah. looking, yeah, and it's back and forth, and that's really the story of our bond with God. Look, the the other the other really fantastic um, conceptualization I, I love, and look, it took me a while to kind of like really understand this and i think it was more my 
my police training because like I'm, I'm a former police officer. I've just come out of the, oh, well, three years ago, I came out of the police. Um, and so like, I always kind of conceptualized God, especially after going in the academy, it's kind of like a, a senior sergeant or a high ranking police officer who you might kind of like go and see to, oh boss, you know, kind of thinking of doing this. What do you reckon? Getting licensed to act that, that, that kind of stuff. That's not what he wants. That's not how he is. He likes to be wrestled with. He genuinely likes to be wrestled with. And you kind of like see that in prayer and you see this in this, and especially in the, um, i got to be honest, especially it's more explicit in the Old Testament conceptualization um, where where there is this wrestling and there's these people are just disagreeing with and arguing with God. And, and uh, look, you know, even in the, uh, even in Exodus, we know, you know, we know from that, that a lot of people after, after everything was revealed, still walked head high, heads held high going, you know, tired of walking around this desert, don't want to do it, going back to going back to that dark Egyptian night. I'm going to go back and live in servitude. I, you know, I've seen all these things. I've tasted the manner. I saw all those things. I get it. No problem. I'm still not walking around, dude. I'm going back to slavery. That's one of the reasons that I get compelled to, Rabbi, like when, when I read this, and again, part of it is my my police training because like a lot of, you know, I spent 30 years gathering evidence and listening to people tell stories and all, all, all these kind of stuff. And I, I don't think it's pretentious for me to say that I have a pretty good insight on how people tell stories, how they remember things, the mnemonics and all that kind of stuff. Something I do find compelling about, and again, this is all the discussions I'm having with all my materialist friends coming through, is that um, there's no question, there's no fear about recording these things where like, yeah, all these people that had eaten the manna and all that, you know, no, they went back to Egypt. Yeah, no. Some people just rejected God. So some people, they, they knew, they saw, they rejected you wouldn't write that down if you were just making up a super story that was just so compelling. Like that's not how a Marvel movie looks. That's not how, you know, these other things look. That's how someone who is writing some stuff going, well, that's what happened. Well, boy, you know, we got to write that down. <laughs> that's kind of, that was, was written in there. I reckon that that's, I got to say, as, as someone who is a seeker, I suppose you'd say, genuinely concerned with the truth, knows a fair bit about gathering narratives and and uh, gathering gathering human versions, weighing them up as to reality. I find that compelling. I think that's one of the reasons why it's true. Um, right. I mean, th th those were failures. Like wh what you're mentioning, that, that was considered a failure and actually a negative. Hmm. But you do find it in, in, in great people and it's not necessarily a failure. We talk about Abraham. We talk about Moses. Yeah. Why have you sent me? Why have you done evil to your people? Yeah. Um, so those interactions are are not, you know, are, are lessons for us as well. Um, main thing there is that, you know, the the idea of not so much for our own interest, but for other people's sake. Say, God, how, you know, uh, this unease that we are meant to have with injustice. Mm. Like, you know, uh, is the uh, uh, the judge of the world will, will allow injustice to happen? Yeah. That's that feeling and that questioning is actually um, a necessary part of our of the interplay that we have with God. Um, and, and all because, those things. Sorry. Because here's an important point that people have to realize. Yep. We're not meant to be okay with, with, with cruelty and evil and injustice. And God doesn't want us to be okay with it. God doesn't want us to say, well, it's all God. He knows what he's doing. I can't understand him. Human beings are finite. God is infinite. How could I imagine to understand him? So therefore, I'll just accept and put my head down. No, he doesn't want that. He wants us to, in a sense, uh, um, say, no, this is not a right. You know why he wants that? Very simple. Here's, here's, a, here's a good, um, Elie Wiesel was asked, why did God allow the Holocaust? Hmm. And he got a little bit indignant and he said to the person, and if I will give you the answer, if I come up with a response that you understand, 
Is that going to help you sleep better at night? Like, what are you hoping to gain out of a response to why a Holocaust? Yeah. So in other words, when we see other people suffer, and we then come have a theological understanding of why it happens, we're basically saying, okay, it's fine that they're suffering. It's okay. There's a reason. There's a logical reason for it. Right? I mean, if if we're in pain because we went to the gym and we worked hard really hard and our, our muscles are aching. So we're not upset about that. It makes sense. You you exercised, you did a good job exercising. Now your muscles are gonna ache. You're a little bit of pain. Okay, yep. it's acceptable. I know I'm getting a benefit out of it, and so on. If we're going to say, okay, you know, this bad thing happened to you, you know why this is the reason. It's something good's got a good's gonna happen, or because you deserve it, whatever it is. Any reason we give means we make it acceptable. And God wants us to understand that evil is not acceptable. When we find a, a reason for evil, then we are justifying it. God does not want us to justify it. God wants us to, to when we see another person suffering. He doesn't want us to justify it. He wants us to call out to him and say, how, how come? Like Abraham did, you know? You're the, uh, the, the judge of the world. How can you allow injustice? Moses says, you know, from the time you sent me, things have gotten worse for the people. Yeah. Not better. <laughs> and so God wants us to use that, that, that argument so that we care. Because the reality is, if the injustice is something that we feel is unacceptable, we will do something to try to alleviate it. That has to be our response. That has to be our perspective. But if we come up with a logical reason of why it was necessary, then then okay, it's necessary. So you so you're 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 okay with it. So you won't be doing anything really to change it. Totally see the point with that. Like it's again, it's it gives us this insight into the, to his nature. He he wants us to wrestle with him. He wants that. He wants the pushback, and mm -hmm. that's you know that's something that kind of astounded me. I, I mean, I I really um and like I, you know I shudder to to say I I, I would I, I I would disagree with you on anything because you know you're very very learned. I I, I think you can understand the point of suffering without it wanting to without that stopping you wanting to ameliorate it you know what i'm saying but um yeah because I, I mean oh can you the very it? fact that you understand it already minimizes it's it's you know it's the, the, the we're not as if we understand it we're not going to be as um passionately again it. I don't know. I don't know. Like you know, I again, I, I spent a lot of time. I kind of and again, I, I look. I'm just thinking out loud, Rabbi. And if I say anything that you know, I, I'm not trying to be insubordinate here. And trust me, I'm you know, I'm, I'm seeking to learn. Mm -hmm. Um, you're a teacher after all. Um, but like you know, I I spent a lot of time, like talking to you know some truly what we would call evil people. Like I was an operational police officer for my entire career. Some of that time was uh, doing sex abuse work. Um, I genuinely don't know how many murderers murders I've been to. I, I just don't know. I don't. I've, I've I've stopped counting how many murderers I know. I've actually broken bread with murderers. Like they've been around my house. Um, I've had really deep conversations with uh, with those people like in the watch house, and especially when you're escorting someone, Rabbi, like. If you're taking someone to jail, like they've been, like they've gone to court, it's all over. It's like, mate, you've been binned. They just want to talk. You know what I mean? So you're flying someone down to jail to two hour flight or whatever it is, and you got to take them through whatever it is, take them and then take them out to the to the bin. They just want to talk. And if you just shut up, and it took me years, God forgive me. It took me years to learn to shut up and listen. But when I did just shut up and genuinely listen, like it was genuinely amazing some of the things that that that, that, that people told me and where I'm going with this is it it gave me a degree of empathy not only with people who do things that are wrong um it also gave me a degree of understanding of like 
Okay, so there, and sometimes suffering can bring people to God. You know what I mean? I think he uses all of these tools. There's no tool that he won't use to bring any individual, you know, to, to him. I said that to a, a very good friend just recently who's going through tough times. I said, look, I, I'm not minimizing what's happening to you. Like you are truly suffering and what's happening to you is bad. But what you've got to understand is this is probably God calling you. Like he's, he's warning you to sacrifice some things that are holding you back from him. You're going to have to burn those things off. So that's that's like you know that's like meaning and point. That doesn't mean that I doesn't that I don't want to relieve that person's suffering. It's just that the way that that person is going about it is the wrong way. It's like you have to let these things go, and if you let these things go, your suffering will be released. And not only that, that suffering will have meaning and point, and you'll get to a higher plane of understanding. Like if you get to God through that suffering, well then, you know, thank God. You know, when we could do that for ourselves, not for other people. Hmm. That's right for ourselves. For ourselves, we have to see, okay, how can I get over it? Uh, this is for my best. This means X, Y, Y, Z. Maybe I have to change this or change that. Or For ourselves, yes, not for others. For others, we have to be indignant. No, it's not right. It's not okay. Uh, because they, and that's what they need to feel. They need to feel more than anything that we're with them. That we feel their pain. And that's all they need. You know, in, in as a rabbi, so to speak, and um, not so to speak, as a rabbi and then and, and as a um someone who's involved in pastoral care, that's what people need. They need to feel you're with them. More than your advice and ideas and um um you know, suggestions. They just need to feel someone is there with them when they're going through hard times. When they're going through hardship, they just want the presence. Mm. Um, you just want to feel someone's there with you. Yeah. And that's and and the more you understand the reason, like like Job's, you know, the friends of Job came to him, give him reasons. Yeah, that's to right. Him, help him, right? Yeah, could be a good reason, but it didn't help him because that's not what he wants. I need reason. I just need you. I just need to know that you care. And, and in the end, I, and I don't need you to be God's salesman. Yeah, and in the end, God gets dismissive with him when he actually gets to confront God. Like you know, there's there's kind of like you know when you read that, God's sarcastic. He's like, where were you when I put the stars in the skies? Yeah. Were you there when I needed you? And you're like, I'm so I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He he gets dismissive and condescending and sarcastic. Like it's not even it, it's there's no you know what I mean? There's kind of there's nothing there. I remember the first time I read Job too, it was like getting towards the end. It's like, oh man, we're gonna find out. God's gonna finally answer this. It's like, no. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've kind of covered off on that. Frankly, I could talk about this stuff for hours. Um, but look, I've got a couple of other, I suppose, more, more secular questions about, about modern times and, and, um, uh, modern events. Um, look, could you tell us, obviously with the terrible events of October the 7th and, you know, then the, uh, God, those pro protest isn't the right word really for that disgraceful event that happened outside of the opera house and some of these ongoing disgraces, would you mind telling us, um, how that's impact, you know, you're the one of the top ranking, I don't know, you know, it's not like the Catholic Church where there's a, a distinct hierarchy. Um, but you know, you're one of the you're one of the more respected elders um in, in the Jewish community. Can you tell us how that's impacting you? Do you know anyone that's that you know that's being impacted this? How that how that's making the community feel? Well, if I'm talking to Jewish people, this is what I'd like to say to them. Um, so from perspective of the uh, you know anti-Semitism or Jew hatred shall we call it yeah. is uh, something that we've experienced for thousands of years um, obviously everyone knows the Holocaust Hitler uh, 
but less known, you know, Stalin's gulags and 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 then uh, you know where my family suffered from uh, imprisonment and sent to Siberia under Stalin. I killed millions of of Jews. Um, the pogroms in, under Tsarist Russia. Yep. The um, under the Christian Crusades, mm -hmm. under the uh, um, you know Spanish Inquisition. Mm -hmm. Um, Chmielitsky massacres in Ukraine, sixteen um, forty-eight and forty-nine. Um, this and and then recently, recently, I mean, hundred years ago, literally, is the, the massacres in Hebron. Mm -hmm. like Sixty-nine people were massacred, similar to October seventh in Hebron. So we have felt on our skin anti-Semitism throughout the ages. Unfortunately, people have somehow believed that after the Holocaust, that's a thing of the past. Yeah. Well, and it's come at us and says, no, it's not. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, seeing it again in the most unbelievable way, speaking today after the United States allowed a resolution for a ceasefire, meaning you cannot get rid of Hamas, meaning you're basically not going to be able to get the hostages on your own. I mean, you're not going to be able to get the hostages. It's unbelievable. What? Why should Hamas make any deals? Why should they make a deal when when the Americans are are working for them, <laughs> stopping Israel from from uh, going after them? So it's like, like, yeah, sure. Why, why make a deal? It's it's unbelievable. I mean, your your head could explode thinking about everything that's going on today in Australia and around the world. But here's what gives me comfort. The Medrash, the Midrash says that um, the Jewish people are like a sheep among 70 wolves. And great is the shepherd who protects them. Amen. So we have a shepherd, that's God. And he protects us ultimately. And but here's a key, here's a very important key. The Talmud asks during the decree of uh, Purim, why why would um why was there such a decree? In other words, the fact that physically there was a decree to annihilate the Jewish people at that time was a reflection of a spiritual decree. And so Haman kind of brought out the expression of the physical decree of, of annihilation. And the Talmud asks why. The Talmud says because they benefited from the feast of Achashverosh. I don't know how you say him in English. <laughs> He's the king at the time, right? Achashverosh, that's the, the pronunciation in Hebrew. X -C -R, whatever. Anyway, so why would that be a reason for a possible annihilation? The answer is, his feast was a party because in his calculation, the prophecy of Jeremiah that 70 years post the first destruction, we will have a second commonwealth and another building of the temple, had passed its date. He made his calculation obviously was wrong, but he calculated that it was it was it's not coming back. So at this feast that he invited the Jews to. He came dressed with the garments of the high priest, took out the vessels from the temple and used them as fruit balls and, 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 and uh, goblets for drinking. And he was showing, this was a, a test to the conquest of the Jewish people. And because they came to this feast, um, because and and they enjoyed it and they they felt oh look we're being accepted hey if we're good with the king then we'll be able to to be safe and maybe we'll be able to make what will be treated equally and we'll have money and whatever so god says you know what live with the wolves die with the wolves you're relying on him and that wolf okay let's see what happens I come. I'm not going to get. I'm not getting involved, so to speak. Let's see what happens. So the practical application of that is that the way to secure ourselves 
is by putting our trust in our shepherd. Like King David says, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We have to put our trust in the shepherd. Now, we have to do things naturally as well. But what we cannot do things that will endanger, that goes against the advice and guidance of the shepherd. And there are very clear advice and guidance of the shepherd on how to interact um, in situations like we're in. Mm -hmm. Namely, you have to secure yourself by yourself as much as you can. You cannot, um, you're, you, you're not allowed to um, give away strategic uh, lands that are necessary for your security. In other words, you cannot put your safety and security in the hands of others, hmm. which is what unfortunately was done in Oslo and was done in, 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 the, um, in 2005 hmm. when we left Gaza. Hmm. We put our security in their hands, hmm. right? We say we're going to leave and then we're not going to trust that you're not going to come after us. Well, they came after us. And now we have to make sure, I don't care what America says or anyone else says, or the UN says. And by the way, the UN is not why we have Israel. We have Israel because God gifted Israel to the Jewish people 3,700 years ago when he promised Abraham, this is going to be the land of your children. And then when we went out of Egypt 3,336 years ago, to be exact, he uh, said, you're going out of Egypt, and I'm giving you this land of, of, of the land of Israel, land of Canaan, which will become the land of Israel. That's why we're there. We're not there because of the UN. Because if live by the UN, die by the UN. They vote this way, tomorrow they vote that way. And then what are you going to say? Hmm. We have to know our rights to Israel are divine. And historically, we've had the presence there you know, all this time. And that's why we're there. And he says, not even because it's Israel, any form of security is such that um, you're, it, you're, it's, it's in the, it's in the code of Jewish law. Hmm. You're not allowed to give up strategically necessary lands for the promise of peace. Yeah. Because if it doesn't work out, you're worse off. And what you're saying then is, I'm putting my trust in the wolf. Yeah, outside of the Lord. So what, what we need to understand now is putting our trust in our shepherd. That's my message to the Jewish community. We need to put our trust in the shepherd. Yes, we have to do things naturally as much as we can, but not if it contradicts the guidance and advice of the shepherd. So that's why Queen Esther fasts for three days before going to the king. Even though fasting for three days doesn't exactly make you look beautiful unless you need to fit into some kind of dress. <laughs> right? <laughs> so um, she fasted three days. Her complexion wouldn't have been as beautiful as, as, as if she didn't. And that's how she went to the king. When you're trying to entice him, because of your beauty, to want to do your bidding, how does it make sense that you fast for three days? The answer is, first, she had to look beautiful in the eyes of that king, king of kings, God. And that's the, the fasting was an expression of, of repentance and uh, return. And then, okay, then we do go through the motions and we go to the, not the king here as well. But we know that ultimately it's the king of kings that's going to give us what we need. And the same thing is true for each and every one of us in a regular life. We have to always realize that our beneficence comes from God. And he tells us you do it through your business. But if you put everything into your business and nothing in God, then it's like making, uh, you know, opening many bank accounts and hoping you can have more money because you opened all these accounts. <laughs> that doesn't help, right? Yes. Uh, so spending more time in your businesses and doing things in business that say, for example, is um, you know cheating and, and 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 lying and so on, is not going to get you the money because that's opening bank accounts without the source of the of the account of the money coming in, which is our trust in God. Mm -hmm. So our trust in God is that which gives us. He tells us to get involved in the business, but he does so. 
but not if it contradicts what he asks us of us. That's something we always have to keep in mind. And so today too, when we put our trust in, in uh, we have to go through the motions and politically talk to whoever we need to talk to and so on and so forth and try to buy arms from whoever is going to sell it to us, etc. But we cannot endanger ourselves for that purpose, endanger ourselves in ways that he told us not to by doing foolish things that have proven again and again to be dangerous and were, were the natural response of which was October 7th. Yeah. But let me ask you something. I know you're the interviewer. Sure. Um, with a uh, background in the police. Yep. How are they allowing these, these uh, preachers yeah. Imams say the most vile things. These uh, protesters saying um, whatever they said, whether it be F the Jews, whether it be we're yeah. the Jews, what well, doesn't matter, or yeah. Gaz the Jew, whatever it is. How could that be? How could the police, I'm not talking about the political side of things, I'm asking the police, yeah. how could police allow that to happen? You know what's going to happen? Oh, it's, 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 it's just going to get stronger and bigger, and it's going to go from the Jews to all. Um, all people that are seen as infidels. Oh, of course. Well, look, one hundred percent. It was. I thought the you know, and I mean no disrespect to my New South Wales former colleagues, but I I thought that oh, it could mean where's the Jews? Oh, that was the most pathetic. You have to be kidding me! Like, and I, I was watching that guy on TV, and I was wondering, surely he doesn't actually believe that. What you know? Surely he's just been said, hey, get well, out. One there. second. Even if if that's what it means. So, so what? Yeah, exactly. That's what they said. So how is that okay? Yeah, it's 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 like you know, it's like just it's absolutely ridiculous. But see, the whole thing about these laws, though, um, yeah, look, if, if you don't mind me sort of opening up this this topic, actually, and again, we'll have we'll have a quick discussion about that. I have um, I have a deep faith in proper traditional British common law. Um, it was always pretty good. Now, I remember when these anti-hate speech laws came out, um, I was really, really young. It was actually before I was in the police. But I remember being ambivalent about it. I remember actually discussing it at high school. We had this, um, it was at high school, and you know, we, we had some really good teachers there. And we had this roundtable discussion about it. And fundamentally, the the kind of take of the, the, the teacher was, look, these aren't good rules. And remember, they were actually, because in Parliament, they were saying, look, the reason we're putting these rules here is to actually protect Jewish people. Like anti-Semitism is one of the things that we're kind of like there to, to protect. We want to round out the last of the Nazis. You know, there's still these, you know, a couple of, and, you know, this was in the 80s. So, you know, I mean, what, 10? Maybe there were 10 guys that still believe that, you know, Mein Kampf was a really good book. I, I don't know. The teacher basically said to kind of really quickly get to the point and said, look, my take is it's a, they're bad laws. They're not going to be used correctly. They're arbitrary. They're subjective. They go against British law because something that's always been a great British law strength is, especially when it comes to criminal uh, stuff, is that like it's it's black or it's white. This is an assault. This is an assault. This is this isn't. So brought in this concept of uh, of of a civil a civil idea of harm, which needs to be proved civilly, into the criminal law. Then it was kind of like in Queensland, it wasn't actually given to the police. Well, in Queensland, and thank God, I must say, um, different New South Wales down there, but in Queensland, we've got all these human rights institutions. Um, I can't I can't actually comment. Uh, what, one of the things is I can't comment on anything that's state government policy. I can comment, comment on federal um, federal government policy and federal government institutions. I, 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 I can criticise respectfully them. And let me tell you, oh, my God, it is so bad, so bad, these human rights things, because they were not written. I don't, I honestly think this, Rabbi, now this sounds a little conspiracy theory. They they were not formed to uphold the laws as they were discussed in Parliament. What happened is you've got a whole bunch of people, and I have to get political about this, who are really left-wing, uh, who were wanting to use these hazy principles to undermine British law, and to be able to turn justice administration as we knew it on the head. 
basically that's kind of like what my teacher there would be a bit of an exaggeration to say that's exactly what he said but he he kind of said you know we're on dangerous ground here we don't know where this is going to end up this is going to end up undermining a couple of long held principles that we've had uh one of them being that you know the, the freedom of speech he goes like you know the the best way to counter these imbeciles who are saying these things uh is i think more free speech but again that's been compromised now because if you speak back against these people, you're Islamophobic or, you know, you're, um, you know, or you're anti-Hamas or something like that. And it's just like, so all of the weapons, you're quite right. Like it's applying the principle you were talking about before about not allowing yourself to be disarmed. Well, fundamentally what the West did when it allowed this Trojan horse of these ridiculous speech laws in and these human rights laws, which are hazy, um, un undefined, ununderstood and conveniently applied by a bunch of people who have very very different agendas and alter different agendas than the people who who wrote this stuff you know back in the day no it's such a bad idea the police should be ashamed of themselves but the whole all those institutions the the, the federal human rights uh institute, they're a joke they're not going to do anything about that I reckon it wouldn't surprise me if half of the people that are in those institutions down there in Canberra, they'd be like clapping along. They would have been, they would have been at some of those, they would have been at a lot of those those places. They're, you're right. They're not going to protect you. Like these, these, they're not going to protect you. Mind you, they're not going to protect me either. You know, so it's not just they're not going to, it's not just not they're not going to protect Rabbi Ari. Oh, uh, sorry, Rabbi Shapiro. They're not going to protect Matt Maloney either. You know, they're, they're not going to protect people like me. They're not going to protect my churches. They're not going to protect my ulcers, you know. Yeah. So, no, absolutely so disgrace. How, how, how does that change? I mean, you have to have the realization that they're, these people are anti-everything anti about Australia. They're not just anti-Semitic and anti-Jewish. Yeah, 100%. They're anti-Western, anti -Westernism, if that's a word. Yeah. Um, and they... You know, they're against everything that's, that uh, Free Australia stands for. And the, the more power they have, the more voices they have, you, Australia is going to lose its identity. 100%. We are a Judeo-Christian. It's, it's that simple. But see, it's, and it's so it, it, it needs to happen now. They need to clamp down on it now or it gets harder and worse. Hmm. It's It's as simple as that. They need to clamp down on, on, on the speech that is going is a cause for for violence. Hmm. It's it's not going to happen. That could, you know, we're seeing anti-Semitic attacks. Where do you think it comes from? It comes from this, you know, this view of the world. Yeah, yeah. That is uh, that is antithetical to what Australia naturally stands for. And it's and if they're not going to squish it, you know, squish it, they're not going to stop it. True. It, it it comes back to because at the at the beginning, and it's kind of I'm glad that we started off where we did because it it gives some understanding and credence to this to this comment. You know, we started off discussing the nature of God, really, mm -hmm. and how you know what it means what a world would look like once all these uh you know and it's only in it's only in god and these contradict you know in the contradictions in the mind of god that these seeming contradictions the finite and the infinite are actually reconciled uh where perfect justice and perfect mercy are reconciled where um where you know suffering uh, again i don't know where where suffering does have suffering is terrible should be fought against we should try and eliminate it but it does also have meaning and point you know all of these contradictory things are are reconciled in, in the mind of god now if you don't accept the judeo christian conceptualization worldview as axiomatic and you have to kind of like do that well then that's how you end up in places like this it's no coincidence. And, and you know, the Muslims are just being used. Like they're doing what they do. Like it's 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 no surprise. I mean, they've been kind of like it's I mean, no disrespect to my I I've been, I've interviewed a couple of the Imams now. And like I, I have some seriously close Islamic friends who I've broken bread with. I've been to their houses. I've, you know, 
I've hung out. I actually led the police response here in Cairns to the cross church massacre. I was proud to do that and proud to protect those people at that time. I would do it all again. It was one, it was like in the top, I got to say that was in the top 10 proudest moments in, in my 30 year, 30 year career. Um, but having said that, like, it's, it's just not like Islam is not like the other Abrahamic religions. It's just not like they're kind of theocratic. You know what? I'll tell you, I'll tell you uh, let me tell you what I think about that. I'll say this without i'm not an expert on islam no i'm a jewish rabbi i know judaism i'll just paraphrase forrest gump islam is what islam does <laughs> yeah exactly right i can only judge it based on what it's doing exactly. and the fact that not one not one so to so-called moderate islamic cleric um condemned October 7th speaks volumes. Exactly. When Baruch Goldstein killed, what was it, 29 Arab worshippers in the cave of the patriarchs yeah. in the early 90s? Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Every Jewish leader from right to left condemned him. Hmm. Condemned this. Not on my, not in my name. No. Right? Not in my name. This is not my Judaism. Don't, you, that's not on me. This is not what we do. Well, they didn't say that on October 7th. No. How could you not condemn it? You're basically saying you agree with it mm. if you don't condemn it. That is problematic. So that's how I would judge Islam based on what they do, not on what they say. And not, I'm saying based on what they do and what they say, not on what their theology is. I have no clue what their theology is, and it's irrelevant to me. The proof is in the pudding, as they say. Yeah. That's the tree vibe. So that is that is that is a major concern. Let me say this. Let me go back to the beginning. I want to. I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with two two points. One is a a theme. We talk about the infinite, the infinite and the finite. So there's two ways of seeing it. Okay, or here's one. God is so infinite, like you, in a sense, like you brought up in the first instance. That if you, this is the terminology used by one of the major works of, of Kabbalah, if you limit him to the infinite and he doesn't have the power in the finite, then you're making him finite by the fact that he doesn't have ability to express himself in the in, in the finite, right? Yeah, totally. Okay? So that's saying that God is able to express himself in the finite because he's infinite. Yeah, totally. Yeah. If he's infinite, then you can't take away his ability to express himself in the finite. Yeah. However, even that expression of finitude is as a result of his infinity. Hmm. Why do I say that he has the power in the finite? Because if he doesn't, he's not truly infinite. <laughs> yeah. So his ability in the finite is because of its infinity, right? Yeah. Okay. That's one thing. One thing to chew over and think about. Let me give you a whole another 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 concept, an important one. Here it is, and this is really the answer to you, Dawkins and so on that you mentioned earlier, and why God is not obvious, etc. I spoke earlier. I mentioned earlier about God's existence being a necessary existence. Everything else in existence, even the spiritual realms, even what we call godliness, which is the uh, the light that that shines forth from him, so to speak, or the spherot, what we call the, the spheres, the energies that are godly energy, so to speak. Well, everything else has a reason to be, has a cause. The cause is God. The essence of God is the cause. The only thing that doesn't have a cause is the essence of God himself. Right? So the essence of God has no cause. Everything else has a cause. So if it has a cause, it means it has a beginning. It doesn't necessarily mean a beginning in time, but a, a beginning in concept. Mm. Why am I here? Because my cause brought me in, makes me here. Right? Why am I here? Because the cause of me being here brought me into existence. Mm. So why is there light? Because there's a luminary. 
Now, if the luminary exists forever, so the light exists forever, but still the light's only here because the luminary was here forever. Mm -hmm. Get that, right? Now, God wants to be reflected elsewhere. So if he wants to be reflected in our world, he creates something that has a falsified but similar sense to himself. Okay? So just like God has a sense of I am here because I'm here. We human beings are able to have a sense of I'm here because I'm here. Yeah. So the I'm here because I'm here, everything else in existence, so to speak, sees that there's a source of why it's here. We don't. Right? Everything else in existence understands that it's here because something else brought it here. Yeah. So it cannot imagine it cannot imagine, similar to the, when the child asks who created God, it cannot imagine something existing without a cause. Right? Everything needs to have a cause. Why is this here? Something else must have brought it here. Right? Even scientifically, we think those are terms. Why is it here? Something has to bring it here. There has to be a cause. The funny thing is that humanity, God creates humanity in a way they don't necessarily need a cause. You know, there's the concept of the Ten Commandments of honoring your parents. Ask people, why honor your parents? Most people will say to me, the reason, let me ask you, why honor your parents? You might get the right, the right answer, but let's say, why honor your parents? Oh, I haven't really thought about this. Well, well I suppose... To, to, to a certain degree there, um, well, they are partially your cause. Secondly, uh, especially your father is, is a reflection of the Almighty. Um, well, although not completely, because like, anyway. Yeah, you're going, you're going deep here. Okay. So I'll explain simply. Sorry, thanks. Most, Sorry. <laughs> most, people, most people who I ask would say, because they, because they raised me, they fed me. They gave me my education. Sure. They took care of me till I became an adult. Sure. Right? They guide me. They love me, etc. All beautiful, all correct, all right. Most people don't say kind of what you just said because they're cause of my being here. Most people don't say that. You know why? Because we cannot imagine ourselves not being. We don't really think of what was before I was? God creates us in a way that our sense of, of identity and being is the starting point. Yeah. We don't think of ourselves as, well, there was a time I wasn't, and now I am. That's not how we think. So we don't really, we're not really grateful to our parents for bringing us into existence because we don't think of non-existence as a reality. We're grateful for them feeding us and helping us and and, and, and right and, and educating us and so on because that we could see yes it was before education after education before um, support after support that I could see so I could be I could have the gratitude for that but the very fact that I exist it's hard for me to relate to that so we have a unique ability to be a reflection of the essence of God. No, in other in every other every other part of the cosmic creation, spiritually cosmic creation, cannot have a sense of not being. I'm sorry, cannot have a sense. On the contrary, cannot have a sense of of not having a source, because everything senses itself having a source. Mm. We human beings are the only ent entity. Or you could say physical things as well, because it doesn't have consciousness. That could say, I'm here because I'm here. I am what I am. Well, what, what did the pop I say? Whatever. Yeah, yeah. I am, I, uh, I am, I am, you know, I'm here because I'm here. Yeah. There's no sense of, well, did someone bring, maybe not, maybe, yeah. In other words, that, that, that atheism that you talked about earlier is the very reflection of the essence of God. Who was here only because he's here. Mm. And if we had a sense that we're here because of a cause, 
right? And and it was it would be impossible for us not to think of ourselves as being here only because there's a cause that brings us here. Then we couldn't imagine, we couldn't conceptualize a God that doesn't need a cause to be here. Yeah, hundred percent. So because we we have an a consciousness which where we don't see um, our cause allows us to be a reflection of the being that doesn't need and doesn't have a cause. Yeah. So he creates us in a way to reflect his very essence. Mm -hmm. Again, shows us, yeah, that's, that's, that, that's that little reflection there. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Totally. Wow. You know, well, you know, I, I suppose I hit you with an easy question to start off with, and you know, you're going to give me something that's going to, going to keep me thinking for the next couple of months. Thank you for that. One. Thank you for that. 